The 359 is sponsored by USB Technology. The USB Implementers Forum reminds consumers that USB IF logos are displayed on certified USB products. So the next time you're shopping for a reliable USB charger, cable, or device, look for the logos. Get the whole story at enablingusb.org. Welcome to the 359. I'm Ben Fox Rubin. I'm Roger Chang. I'm Alfred Ng. So Alfred, you just got back from Vegas where you attended the DEF CON and Black Hat Cybersecurity Conferences. First of all, what was what was it like? How did you like it? I mean, there was a ton of cybersecurity news that had come out of there. I think I wrote like nine stories in three days. All right, stop um, showing off. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the big headline there was most likely the election hacking village. This is the second year in a row that they've done it. Uh, this time around, they wanted to prove all the naysayers wrong by basically saying we're putting mostly machines that are already in use because there was a criticism of last year's uh voter hacking village. Oh, we don't even use that machine anymore. So about 70% of the machines that were brought this time were are actually being used in this year's election. And, okay. Mm -hmm. So, and how easy were they to hack? I mean, like, are we in a lot of trouble? I mean, so a lot of them were pretty simple to hack, but another criticism of it, it of this year's village is uh, is basically, you know, yeah, but they have unlimited access to it. They can just go in and like have as much time as they want with it. During an actual election, on election day, you know, you have all these volunteers watching you and making sure you don't go and put like a flash drive in it or anything like that. Um, but I think there's still, you know, a lot of valid points being made from here where basically the idea is, okay, but you're still using this machine. And like, just because you have people watching for it doesn't mean that there can't be, you know, some issue with like physical security where like your volunteer is not looking at it at this time. And then the idea is like if people lose their confidence in an election in the voting machines, like even if it's just one machine that's compromised, the mm, whole totally. point yeah. is, you know, I don't know if I can really trust who we elected anymore or anything like that. Yeah. Um, let's go to Teddy Ruxpin. You just published this like earlier this morning mm -hmm. about hacking the new Teddy Ruxpin. And it seems kind of kind of weird. Yeah. So this was more of a, a fun story. Um, so Parents out there who have a Teddy Ruxpin, I just want you to know that this isn't one of those hacks that, you know, your kid's information is lost or anything like that. Basically, a cybersecurity researcher wanted to take a look and see if he could put anything that he wanted on it. Um, Teddy Ruxpin has a complex um, file system that, like, you can it only accepts files in a certain system, but he was able to do it. Um, and he basically took a video clip from the movie Hackers from, like, 1995, where this guy's yelling, hack the planet. <laughs> And then he puts it on the Teddy Ruxpin um, and its eyes are showing like the DEF CON logo instead of its like cute, like blue LED eyes. Yeah. yeah. Mm, um, nice. But yeah, this this guy that had done it is already an IoT security uh, researcher. And he anytime he gets like a smart toy for his kid or anything like that, he wants to see all the different ways that he can hack it. So this one was kind of safe. So he, he gave it to his kid and now he can put <laughs> any story that he wants on it. So, well, But also, was it easy to actually hack Teddy Ruxpin? Um, I mean, once he figured out what kind of like files that it needed and like how to convert like his images and audio into that file, then yes. But, you know, I think the whole process of figuring that out might have taken a bit longer. Okay. Nice. Uh, also, we wanted to talk about smart cities, too. So this is this is something where more things are getting connected these days yeah. and... I guess that means there are more vulnerabilities and more ways to like hack into a smart city, right? Yeah, this is much more serious than the the Teddy Ruxpin hack. So <laughs> these were um, they these researchers basically took a look at secure smart city systems from three different companies that you know one does like controlling lighting uh, to uh, one does like flood warnings and then another one does like road stuff um, like for smart cars and things like that. And they found like really simple vulnerabilities. Like some of them had like their password set on by default. Uh, some Oof. of them they could, <laughs> yeah. So like one of the tips that they basically gave to these companies, like maybe you should like change your passwords if you're going to like implement them uh, in your in your entire city. <laughs> it's like a tip for everybody yeah. when, when it comes to smart cities. So I reached out to the three companies, all of them who said they fixed it. One of them behind the cars basically said, you know, we don't um, test this on public roads. They were being used by the Federal Highway uh, Administration. Um, mm -hmm. But it wasn't being used on any public roads, thankfully. So um, there's not that much of a danger there either. Nice. Well, luckily now I'm terrified about everything. Uh, lastly, we wanted to give a shout out to Claire Riley's story on Cooper Petty, an opal mining town in Australia where people live in underground mining holes. Definitely check out that story. If you want to read more about these stories, check us out on CNET. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Ben Fox Rubin. I'm Roger Chang. I'm Alfred Ng. Do do.
And thanks everybody for joining us for the recording of the audio podcast. Now, as always, I'm going to jump into the chat and try to pull out any good questions and comments you guys have about the que- the uh, topics at hand. Alfred, you've had a really busy week. Mm. Uh, I, I, I want to hear. I'm honestly, I'm mostly surprised to find out that the Teddy Ruxpin has a complex file system. You would think that something like a toy may be a little more easy to access. Could you I mean, expand on that a little I would, bit? I would understand why it has a complex file system, like mostly because they... The, so the only way you can get stories for your Teddy Ruxpin is through the app itself that like they, they provide. Mm. Um, and it like transfers over Bluetooth. So the way that he did it though is because because he couldn't infiltrate the app, he like plugged a mini... U, like he plugged it into the USB port in the back and uploaded it that way. And even when he does that, he can't create a new story that you can access from the app. You basically have to replace the files uh, from another story. So, like, mm. you would uh. open up, like, I don't know what stories Teddy Ruxpin has, but let's say it has, like, uh, the Three Little Pigs. You would, like, open that up, but and then you would put, like, the stuff that you want it to play in that file. Um, so would you basically on the app play Three Little Pigs? And yeah, but that... it would play, like, what you want Got instead. Um, but, yeah, let me look through this. But, like, it's it's very... I guess like nuance. It's very specific. So like for the right. images, you can't do it to somebody else's remotely, yeah. or you right. wouldn't be able to do it to like thousands at the same yeah. time. For the images on the eyes, um, they have to be 128 uh, by 128 pixels mm. um, because the eyes are only like 1.25 inches. Right. Um, and then the audio itself has to be like a specific type of wave file. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even beyond that, he have to you have to put it through a. Um, what's it called, a formatter to make it a, a custom SNX ROM format. Um, I have no idea what that, what an sure. SNX uh, ROM Is that like just a file. different, like a custum format? Yeah, for, for Teddy Ruxpin, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sounds like more like a hobbyist project than something yeah. I mean, that it's I definitely, definitely I, think, I think this is one of those things you see at BlackHat.com, right? Just sort of like these random hacks that, yeah, they're not practical, but they're interesting to see. Yeah. I really, I thought it was really interesting to see, you know, the Teddy Rock's been yelling out, hack the planet, so. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's go to that videotape, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. Where am I supposed to look? (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Sorry, we just had to get a little taste of that, right? Oh, (laughs) totally. I I, kind of want to Teddy Rock's been now. Hack so, the planet, Ben. <laughs> do do we think this is gonna open up a whole new market for like not build a bear, but like hack a bear kind of thing? Custom Ooh. custom toys for your kids? Yeah, so I asked him about that and um like if he's put any like specific stories that he's done for his own kid. Turns out there's a lot of work that goes into like the stories that Teddy Ruxpin has on its own because like it, if it tells you a story it's like, oh, it was sunny out, and then like the arms are supposed to move to, and then like it shows like a sunny sky. So like you would have to have the videos in the eyes timed to the story as well. So, you know, oh. he did this project in a way that was like, this is fun for like DEF CON and like, look look at this like really novelty thing. Whereas like if you wanted like a whole video thing like synchronized, like that's a lot of work, mm-hmm. which like they do at, you know, Wicked Toys, the company behind mm. Teddy Ruxpin. But like for a hacker, like I don't really like you can put in the effort for it, but um, I don't know if it'd be worth it. You know, it. if you really love your kid, you would do Make that. a custom story. Yeah, yeah, you would. Or to, like, freak out your younger sister, I suppose. That would be one reason. You're the hacker doing it, though, for, like, a, on your sibling? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Ben, I feel like there's a story behind you and your siblings. <laughs> oh, there's, there's a very long story. Uh, let's go to the chat and take some questions from Fujian. Uh, do you think that blockchain can help with the election hacks? No. They go on. No. <laughs> wait, wait, no. Yeah. wait. They no. go on to say. They go on to say. I think that I read several governments are testing blockchain with their elections to try and prevent these. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so West Virginia rolled this out last week. They're doing a blockchain-based uh, mobile election like voting thing. They're doing it from their phone. Here's the thing about that, though. Even if like the app itself is working on blockchain, your phone can be compromised. Yeah. So it's like the service like think about like when people's bitcoin wallets get like robbed right it's bitcoin is secure like they're not going to just straight up steal that but they can hack your computers to mm-hmm. take that and that's why it's a terrible idea this is well it's a limited pilot right now right it's specifically yes. meant for armed services that people people that are serving overseas so they are going to test it out, and uh, I, I obviously understand that blockchain is very much a buzzword these days, but the idea of providing more capabilities, more technological capabilities for people to vote, I think 
is a good idea instead of just doing paper balloting and showing up at the voting booth all the time. I think it's important to like test it on thing on votes that that are inconsequential and like don't matter before like putting it on an election thing. Like maybe mm. try blockchain voting for American Idol or, <laughs> or like, naming a boat. Yeah, yeah. but oh yeah. yeah, that worked out really well. Last <laughs> try time. that first, and then if that works out, then maybe let's talk about doing that for elections. But like because like. This is not a place to like test something out in, in, in that sense. You know, it's like, oh, we'll see if it works. And then somehow an elected official is like considered illegitimate because like it might have had security issues. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that's no, no, no to blockchain and <laughs> election security. Do, do you think from from your perspective at Black Hat and DEF CON, do you think that because there's so much more attention to election hacking now than in 2016 that like. They're, they're more prepared. There's more awareness. There's a little bit more um, urgency it depends. to like actually preparing for the midterms. It, it, it depends on what state and what county. So like the Department of Homeland Security does a lot. Like they helped secure like funding for a lot of states to get it. But at the same time, not every state has basically said like we need this. And they can't basically say like you can't use this machine in your county because it's run by state and local mm -hmm. officials. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. a speech from like, you know, Vice President Mike Pence um, about the week before De uh, DEF CON, he mentioned there are 14 states currently that are still underfunded, not underfunded, but underprepared mm. for election day. And the problem- I, I'm surprised it's, I would have expected more. It's just more. 14? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But the problem with this village, at least from my perspective, was basically that like, yes, they're doing a lot of great research and yes, they're finding a lot of vulnerabilities, but it is not going to make it to election officials in time. Like they're going to put the report mm. out in September. That's two months- from election day right. and and at that point it's already too even, late yeah, yeah even if there is a massive vulnerability with like all the voting machines in your county mm. from this report what are you gonna do like oh, you're man. not gonna like <laughs> That's order a whole ton of them within two months i mean go I, back to paper ballots i mean the good thing i guess is that you know they can use that knowledge for the 2019 election but like <laughs> there's basically like not much that they can do at this point which is hilariously sad mm. but um I guess the hope is that they are prepared already, which DHS has done a lot of work from 2016 onward to make sure that happens. Like, it's not like they waited until now to tell everybody. Right. Like, but the question stuff. is whether it's filtered down to the state level. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that that is that is a pretty big problem. Also, a lot of like local states have issues with like contract stuff. So mm. it's like, oh, we want to switch voting machines because, you know, when you sold this to us, like we didn't really consider security vulnerabilities or anything like that. Now, like that we are, we don't want to use your machines anymore. Like, well, you're in a contract with us till like 2022. Oh, so yeah. Yep. Give us more money. Um, that, and I think that was that was another factor that like is not considered that much is like vendors. So like people, when they look at election security, they look at, they point the fingers at like elected election officials, the DHS, you know, state and local counties. But it's also up to the vendors. You know, they should right. be the ones fixing these vulnerabilities, not like, asking people like oh just buy different stuff or switch to different things i agree with you but yeah. they're generally not on the hot seat i mean like you mentioned Debold in your yes. story i think there's probably a couple of other vendors out there mm -hmm. there's it's like there's just less awareness yeah uh for that and it's much easier to you know that's what i'm saying it's finger. also on them yeah you know, it's not oh just i agree on, with yeah. you i agree i think to ben's point that like no one's getting angry at a, a Debold or diebold they're yeah they're getting angry at the elected officials the state mm -hmm. the, you know because they're just an easier target yes my point is that they should be getting angry right. at yeah. the vendors. Yeah, and somebody in the chat, tell me how to pronounce Diebold. Diebold? Diebold? Is it Diebold? I don't Whatever. know. Whatever. Diebold is a Christmas movie, all right? Starring Bruce Willis. Yeah. So. <laughs> Either way. That's going to be like that. I feel like that's a good name for a Die Hard sequel. Diebold? Diebold. That's an awesome and name. That's like the off brand that you get at like Walmart. Or... Nice. Uh, let's take another question from K19. Uh, how does one get involved with DEF CON? I always wonder if the ah. convention is open to the public. Yeah, it, it's open to the public. You can, uh, it's every summer, um, and it's much less expensive than Black Hat. Uh, but yeah, you can just go. Um, you check it on their website and find out when it is. If they tell you that DEF CON is canceled, that's not true. Um, <laughs> that, that is a long running joke with DEF CON where it's basically like anybody that's like new to it will ask like, oh, when is DEF CON or anything like that? Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, it's no, canceled. DEF CON is canceled. Um, so most of the times it's not canceled. Uh, there's been a few cases where it's come close to being canceled from what I've heard. But, oh, really? um, yeah. That's also a joke. Yeah. So just check it on there. <laughs> Um, yeah, just check it out on their website. It's open to the public. You can uh, come as press. You can come as uh, 
just a normal person. You can go as like a, a contestant, like the, all these different contests and stuff. If you're a security researcher, I'm sure you know that you can go as a speaker. Yeah, they have, they have all these like different things that you can go there for. Mm. And what about Black Hat? Same thing. It's open to the public, but it's also much more expensive because Black Hat is more for like corporate, like cybersecurity companies. Right. Which one's the more fun show to go to? I mean, to? I guess it depends on what you like. Um, like they have a show floor for um, Black Hat where like okay. they have like, oh, check out this stuff from like Semantic. They also do all these like weird, like kind of gimmicks to like get you to like stop at their booth and oh, like talk yeah. to them and like stuff. Like a normal trade show. Yeah. So yeah. if you like, if you like swag, like if you like free stuff, then Black Hat, Black Hat is for you. There's a ton okay. of free stuff there. That's I got a blockchain necklace there. Um, is it just a, it's literally like a cinder, like it's like a 3d printed cinder block on like a chain. That's kind of cool. And you're not wearing it now. Why? It's at my desk. I can go get it, but I don't want to walk off set. So, okay. Uh, uh, thank you to Mark Fitzpatrick and Matthew Datch for clearing it up. It is pronounced D bold. Yes. D bold. You got it right. Let's take one from our old friend, Sendroy. Why isn't, uh, or why aren't the IT giants jumping into EVM development? Dubious elections are a worldwide problem. Any corporate or any corporation can make huge money by getting national contracts. Mm, I don't know. Is this well, you can't get a national contract for it. Was that, this, well, regardless, like, is this a minefield that like a company like Google or Apple? Yeah, that's would also. Want to be yeah, part I of? don't think they want to be a it's part. Heavily of Heavily regulated. Like, There's a lot of scrutiny there, and if it fails, that's, that's on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's on and, them. And their work with the military has already been like seriously uh, uh, criticized yes. and yeah. scrutinized for sure. So. Yeah. I think they want to stay in their lane on this one. Like, yeah, it would take like it's an, an interesting. It would idea. take an extreme amount of money for them to jump into this dumpster fire. Right. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, to Alfred's point, it's not a national contract. You'd have to win them state by state. Yeah, which I don't think is worth it's, it for them. It's a lot of work. You've got to have basically a lobbyist or, or sales team in all fifty states. Sometimes different counties within states, mm -hmm. and that's just that's a lot of trouble. Uh, let's take a couple more questions for a call today. Uh, another one from Fujian. How does hacking into a phone prevent blockchain from providing appropriate election votes? Wouldn't people have to hack millions of phones? And if your vote is on blockchain, is it safe? I mean, in the same way that like, so if you use Signal or you use WhatsApp or you've used iMessage, like that's encrypted like messaging, like that's supposed to be secure too. You can't like pick up like what I'm sending you through signal, um, through like Wi-Fi or anything like that. You can't, like the NSA can't really intercept that. But what they can do is they can like get, if they have access to my phone, they can just open the signal app and see it that way. That's what I mean. Like encryption, yes, is like extremely secure and as is blockchain, but there are workarounds to it that like makes it like inconsequential in some scenarios. Right, but to, to, to his point, um, hacking a bunch of phones individually, yes, that, it, it's not scalable. Yeah, so. but th like this wouldn't be hacking phones in the sense of like you can also hack like accounts like if you can log mm -hmm. into like your android phone um oh, yeah. Yeah. with like you know using uh if, if i just have access to like your gmail account or something like that and then i can like set up my phone to log into your gmail account and then from there i can find out your login to your blockchain voting app that you have like that's like uh that's like a pretty like good workaround for that like your blockchain the vote itself like is most likely secure, like if you're using like a form of encryption on it. But like there are like several workarounds for that. Uh, I just hope the hackers have have my same political leanings, so if they're just <laughs> going to vote the same way I would anyway. You know, that's that's what I would be. Well, that's looking the thing, for. it would be. I mean, I guess if you had access to the account information of like whatever hundreds of thousands yeah. of accounts, that would work. But it, I guess I mean that that would be kind of tough to scale if you didn't have that. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Scaling is always like the the That's biggest challenge the on these right. things. So yeah, I I understand, but I just but like like the point that I mentioned on the podcast also like even if it's just one phone that's hacked and like one phone that's compromised, that still like mm. really like shakes the core of like confidence in right. elections. Right. Um. And that's what all like this whole hacking village thing really is about for me at least. Where you know the the idea is and. They said this about the 2016 presidential election, too, where they basically said, like, there's no proof that any votes were altered by, like, any of these Russian hackers that, mm -hmm. like, but they did, they were successfully able to, like, shake the core of, like, trust and confidence in our election. And they didn't even, yeah, but that's, that's a really good point. They didn't even change the votes. Yes. All they had to do was infiltrate certain systems and show that Mostly they were Mostly voter there. records. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, that's my point, though, that, like, 
another angle of this is to basically like have you not trust your vote um and they don't have to change the vote to do that mm. hmm. yeah the only thing you can do is just vote for mickey mouse and then call it a day all right one more question on a way out the door from Srinjoy one more time did the evm defendants say that such vulnerability exposure would reduce voter turnout among the young generations um I mean, the, uh, is he asking, did the vendors say that or like the folks in the hacking village? It just seems like generally anybody in the village, uh, anybody who is a defender of the exposure, uh, how would that sway young generation turnout? Um, I think that's a bigger question than like voter, like voter hacking um, content. I mean, I'm sure there's many other reasons why younger people are disillusioned with democracy and voting. Um, this could contribute to it. I don't think it's the only reason, though. Or or main reason, really. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess we'll just kind of leave it, leave it there. It's a very I'm sorry, conceptual I, question. I, I'm that, very like, green on this entire topic, so I'm learning throughout this entire conversation today, as I do most days. Most <laughs> days. Uh, closing thoughts before we wrap it up. Let's... Let's go ahead and put our votes out for what we think the next best toy to hack is going to be. I'm putting my money on Tamagotchi. Gotcha. Is that back already? Maybe it's back. I don't know. And oh, Pog4. the Sony the, robot. The, the, the Simon Says uh, thingy? Is that, isn't that connected now? Don't they the, have a new one that's, uh, that's all fancy and internet connected? The color music thing? Yeah. Just, so what? It's just going to like do the wrong beat and destroy your self-esteem? Yes, exactly. I, I, exactly. It's, so the Sony dog, Hack what is it? The a Ibo? Ibo? The Ibo. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Ibo. Just turn it turn it into like an attack dog or something. Not sure. But an adorable attack dog. Yeah, yes. that thing doesn't yeah. even have knives, dude. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a slogan worthy of a t-shirt. <laughs> doesn't even have knives. Doesn't even have knives. <laughs> So wait, and uh, what what would you do to hack the uh, the Magic Leap? Just again disorienting dream sequences. I would make sequences? it profitable. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> wow. Okay. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Good That's night. Pretty solid. All right. Uh, let's. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. That was fun. Uh, tell us in your comments and questions and tweet at us. Let us know what you think a good toy to hack would be besides Teddy Ruxpin and uh, what challenges could be uh, at hand to do so. Uh, until then, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks again to USB for sponsoring the show. Uh, ben, you going to take us out of here? Sure. Uh, the 359 is available on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, FeedBurner, Google Play Music, Google Podcast, the Amazon Echo, and of course, CNET.com. Thanks, everybody, for your questions, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.